Good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone in the public gallery and otherwise to turn any electrical devices to silent, please. Um, the first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items four and five in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. We now turn to the committee looking at the Damages, Investment, Returns and Periodical Payments Scotland Bill. And today we have a number of witnesses on our panel. Uh, first of all, Kate Donaghy of the Forum of Insurance Lawyers. Then Alan Rogerson, Forum of Scottish Claims Managers. Norma Shippen, Director and Legal Advisor for NHS National Services Scotland, and Joy Atterbury, who is Head of Litigation for NHS National Services Scotland. And finally, but not least, James Dalton, who is the Director of General Insurance Policy for the Association of British Insurers. So welcome to all of you this morning. Thank you for coming in to the committee. And uh, can I just say that your microphones will be operated by broadcasting. There's no need to uh, press any buttons or anything that will be dealt with automatically. Um, there's no need to answer every question asked by every committee member, but do come in as you feel appropriate. And if you do want to uh, come in, simply raise your hand to indicate to me that you'd like to come in if you're not being uh, brought into the discussion. Now, um, if I might start with uh, a number of questions, I think uh, some of you may have um, probably, I think some of you will have certainly looked at the evidence that was given to the committee last week, perhaps some of the, the other side of the argument, if we think of this in terms of pursuers and defenders' representatives. Um, may I ask uh, what your thoughts are on the, the present uh, personal injury regime, whether or not it, I think what has been talked about is undercompensation or overcompensation for uh, those who have been uh, injured and seek uh, personal uh, injury compensation. Um, what are your views about whether or not either of these scenarios is present in the current system and I suppose uh, how this would play out under the, the proposed regime? I don't know who would like to start with that. Um, James Dalton, I think, volunteering. Uh, uh, so I think that the current framework for setting the discount rate is 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 one that is broken. And the reason I say that is because the, the, the damages um, framework and the and the decision making from the uh, from the courts has meant that the, the way that the rate is set bears no relationship to what pursuers do in reality. It, it assumes that a hundred percent of a pursuer's compensation is invested in one type of asset. No rational um, investor, whether seriously injured or otherwise, would take that decision. And it also assumes that 100% of that compensation is invested in, in index-linked securities, which again is not a balanced portfolio. So what we are very supportive of is this legislation, which changes the framework to one or that of, for, for setting the rate that bears much more relationship to what happens in, in reality. It is a much more modern framework, um, and there are some parts of it that we might come on to later in discussion that we would like to see tweaked. But broadly speaking, the old framework is, is broken, and this new framework is a significant improvement. So from your point of view, it's not about over or under compensation, but about um, having the proper framework in place, and the current one is not a proper framework from Co what you're saying. Correct. The, the, the framework is the, is the thing that we should be focusing on here. Um, Alan Rogerson. Um, I just wanted to add, one, one of the things that occurred to me is there was a lot of talk in the evidence last week about um, risk averse. Seriously injured people are risk averse because they need to provide for the future, for care aspects. And that is absolutely true, and I fully support that principle. That's probably where part two of the bill comes in with the periodical payments, where you have someone that is very risk averse or has requires certainty. That is exactly where PPOs come in, and periodical payments would be uprated by reference to a wage inflation index, for example, for care workers. Part one of the bill, where we talk about investment choices that an injured person would make, um, I think you have to look at it as that provides flexibility for an injured person. 
They will be properly advised on how to invest their damages, and that's certainly contained within the bill. And it's about looking at what the real world choices are for people, where they choose to invest their damages and what rates of return they're likely to get. And do you think that's appropriate to look to what people actually do or want to do rather than having a, a set uh, approach to things? I think it's to provide the flexibility so that there's a clear choice there. If you require absolute certainty for the future where you're risk averse or you have a certain need, that's a periodical <laughs> payment. Whereas people do like to be more flexible and, and in my experience injured people do like to take that lump sum and have control over their future. So, for example, I had a case, um, I should say my day job is working as a claims manager for Aviva, as well as the former Scottish claims manager. Um, I had a case two or three months ago where the settlement was future losses in the form of loss of earnings and pension losses. And the injured person actually decided to go and buy a house in the immediate aftermath of the settlement. So it wasn't so much about the choices that she was being advised to make, but she needed the flexibility of that lump sum. She wanted to go and do what she wanted to do with that settlement. And we absolutely support that principle, that it is for injured people to decide what they want to do with the compensation they receive. Now, uh, Norma Shippen. Um, it, I think it's very difficult for us to know whether people are over or undercompensated with their damages because we don't make any inquiry after the case is settled as to what people do with their compensation. But what we try to do when we're negotiating a settlement is come to a fair settlement with the, the pursuer's agents in the context of the rules that are available to us at the moment. And what we have found is that when you settle by lump sum in the catastrophic brain injury cases, it will always be the case that you're either overcompensating or undercompensating. Because, as Lord Stewart said in the D against Greater Glasgow Health Board case, the one thing that you can be sure about is that you will get the life expectancy wrong. And so it will either be too little or too much. And so either you'll be giving a sum that's going to be too high or too low. And that's why um, within the NHS, in the past few years, we have moved as a matter of practice to, to always offering periodic payment orders when it comes to catastrophic brain injury cases, because in that way, it, it's the right thing to do for the individual but it also is the right thing to do for the NHS, which is all we can speak for, because it enables that um, life expectancy roulette to be taken out of it. So I, I think that's probably what we would say. Joy, is there anything? Uh, I think when you say we'll always get the, the, the life... Um, the length of life wrong is, of course, the, the court and yourselves calculate at the base of actuary yeah. aerial tables, don't you, if it's going to be a lump sum, so... Well, you get, but you get evidence from experts as to what the life expectancy is going to be, and there's always a, there's usually a dispute about how long that will be. So you, you, you may get a variation of up to 15 years of a, yes. of a difference. It's not an exact science it's not from, an exact from science. anyone's point of view. Yes. Um, I'd like to move on now to questions from Jackie Bailey. Good morning. Defender representatives have argued that the notional portfolio set out in the bill is overcautious. Um, I wonder whether you could tell us why that is. And I'll, I'll start with Mr. Dalton, given that there's supplementary information provided to us. Sure. So uh, the the research that we provided to the committee suggested that the um, portfolio of of assets is is quite a conservative one that's been determined by the Scottish government, and it also um, assumes a 30-year investment horizon. Now, those two things taken together in our submission make that a very conservative, low-risk portfolio of investments. Um, our analysis would suggest that an average life expectancy of a settled claim is around 40 to 45 years. Um, so, so 30 years is very short. And in that context, um, by having a, a, a portfolio that is underweight on equities means that you're not hedging your inflation risk sufficiently. So if you were to increase the size of the portfolio of equities within that overall portfolio, you're better able to manage that, that um, inflation at risk. 
combined if you were to combine that with an extension of the, the portfolio's life expectancy from 30 to 40 years for example you would get a less conservative but still low risk portfolio but by interest somebody else will explore the time scale with you um, but but by definition equities are riskier and we know that markets go up and markets come crashing down again um, why are you introducing that element of risk to somebody who wouldn't be engaged in this discussion if they weren't injured in the first place. Surely risk-free is 100% comp compensation. There's no such thing as risk-free. Um, and, and if the pursuer uh, wanted to pursue an option that's, that very significantly reduced their risk, as was said earlier, then they would take a PPO in the context of the independent financial and legal advice that they have received in the context of the settlement of their claim. It's for the, ch it's for the claimant to choose um, which option to pursue. In terms of the portfolio, it's not a, I don't think we're suggesting that we, are, uh, we would invest in, that the portfolio would invest in East Asian IT startup companies. I think it is a question of increasing the overall equity balance in that portfolio, but those are likely to be relatively conservative equities relative to the very conservative asset classes of cash. Okay. Mr. Rogerson? Um, just to add to that, I think there's a lot of comparisons between uh, an injured person taking a lump sum and then investing it and the drawdown pension market. So I think Professor Vass talked last week about closed pension schemes, which to me is far more aligned to a defined benefit pension, whereas someone in a drawdown pension is there to provide for their future and invest for their future. So they'll be accessing the same investment markets as we are talking about for injured people. And certainly when I've spoken to an independent financial advisor before, he likened investing in equities and not investing in suntan lotion and sun hats, but investing in suntan lotion and umbrellas at the same time to try and hedge some of the, the downsides to playing the markets as well. But the, the idea is that people, injured people and drawdown pension investors alike would be looking to invest their sum for the future and get the best possible rate of return, but being properly advised by proper financial advisors to make sure that they are being cautious in their approach, not overly cautious as we would deem the portfolio as it is at the moment. Okay. Kate Donachie. I think the point is that you can't make a lump sum risk-free because you can never know what is going to happen in the future. Um, and the only way you could you could try to remove the risk for a pursuer would, would be to deliberately and significantly overcompensate, which would depart from the 100% compensation rule. Um, and it's not necessary, as Alan and James have said. There is as close as you can get to risk-free option for pursuers, and, and that's a PPO. And that would mean that they wouldn't have to take any risks with stocks and shares or investments. Okay. I don't think we would really have much to comment on, on that okay. question. I think we would defer to actuaries and those. Okay. Let let me come back to Mr. Dalton then, because um, in its submission to the committee, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries noted that insurers have to account for personal injuries liabilities on a risk-free basis. Why do you therefore think it's fair to expect pursuers to take on more risk? than insurance companies do themselves. So I think um, this is a very important point that, that I think um, does need some clarification. Mm. Um, there is a, a difference between the, the discount rate in terms of how one calculates damages in personal injury cases and the way that insurers have to provide capital on their balance sheet from a solvency perspective. Those are very different things. The risk-free, in inverted commas, rate uh, is set by a European regulator, the European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, um, and that, that risk-free rate is used solely to value liabilities. It's not used to value personal injury claims. So it's about valuing the li long-term liabilities that an insurer has on their, on their balance sheet. But there is a principle that underlines both. Very, Maybe very, different situations, but the principle is the same. 
Well, the, the, the principle is that the, the discount, that the risk-free rate that is applied for insurers valuing liabilities is about addressing the solvency and capital issues that, that, that insurers are required to adhere to to ensure that they are that they retain their solvency. Well, in this context, what we're talking about is how you value a, a personal injury claim uh, that has a longevity to it, uh, and those are different things that have different rates that are reflected in it. And what I would say is that in terms of the EOPA risk, um, risk-free rate, they are never negative. Okay, thank you, convener. Thank you, and Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, um, convener. <clears throat> Um, Mr. Rogerson, you, you, you mentioned a, a client that you had who bought a house and, and said that it's for injured people to decide what to do with damages. So, as a matter of principle, why should the bill make any assumptions about what people will do? I think there has to be a starting point of assuming what people will do. Um, as part of the settlement process, you would expect an injured person to be properly advised by their solicitors and financial advisors. And what you're looking at there is compensating someone for their future loss of earnings, uh, their pension losses and their future care needs. So, unfortunately, the way the discount rate has been approached to date is to look at what sort of rate of return there would be or what an investment would be. And in actual fact, you may get injured people who that's exactly what they choose to do, is invest that capital sum for their future. Some people, uh, particularly in the drawdown pension market, for example, I did draw the parallel there, um, they like the idea of the flexibility that allows them what to do with their capital sum, but also an attraction of leaving something behind for their dependents. And I think it's appropriate to look at injured people the same way because they'll have the same considerations about providing for the rest of their life and also providing for their family after they're gone. Okay, so the, pr the principle is that we do need a discount rate because we're paying a sum of money <coughs> up front mm -hmm. for the future. Um, and it, the question at the heart of this bill, at least the first part of it, is about how to set that discount rate. Could, could I move on to the, um, the question of the 30-year period that is contained in the, the bill as part of the assumptions um, that have to be taken into account? I mean, we've heard from Mr Dalton, who thinks that's possibly too short, should be maybe 40. Um, I'd like the views of any other panellists who have a view on that, and, and in particular whether you think there should be scope for some flexibility around that, given that each case turns on its own facts and its own merits. Um, I would just add to that, so we, we talked a little bit about actuarial tables and life expectancy. So a notional 30-year period for the portfolio. Um, so the expectation of a, a 56-year-old male in the UK is 29.64 years. So anyone under the age of 56 would go above that 30-year notional period. For women, it's 29.76 is life expectancy at 59 years. So that's why I think the 30-year period is perhaps too short. Your second point about um, flexibility, I think that is a very good point about flexibility within the bill and whether you choose to look at that again as to whether to set Potentially, other jurisdictions around the world do split rates in terms of a discount rate, so they'll do a set period. Um, Jersey, for example, came out and announced yesterday for under 20 years they were going to set a discount rate of 0.5%. For periods over 20 years, they were looking at a discount rate of 1.8%. So there are examples out there around the, the globe that could be looked at, um, and it's whether the committee is minded to, to consider those. Um, Joy Atterbury. Yes, I mean, our experience is probably slightly different to those of the insurers in that the cases that we're principally dealing with at this um, very high level will often usually be um, babies who sustain brain damage um, at birth. So the cases are being settled when these children reach usually about eight years, by the age of about eight years, the experts will usually be prepared to take a view about um, the life expectancy. Um, of that child. But what it does mean is that um, life expectancy predictions can vary and, you know, very, very, um, very hugely. Um, 30 years in some cases will be you know, about, about right, but it may be 
it may be considerably more, and in some cases, um, unfortunately, it can be considerably less. So the idea of variability is, is not a is not a bad one um, in terms of our experience. But the, the number of cases that we're actually dealing with um, as lump sums, as you can see from the statistics we've provided you with, are, are very, very small. They're nearly all being dealt with by PPO, and therefore it may be that our you know, input to this is not particularly helpful. Sorry, they're nearly all dealt with by, sorry? By PPO. By PPO, yeah. For, in, in health? Yes, in health, yes. Um, uh, broadly speaking, what's the situation in the general insurance market? Sorry, I should have announced that I was wanting to speak there, sorry. Um, I've been doing serious injury claims and dealing with seriously injured people for the last 18 years of my career, and I have never been asked to settle on a periodical payment basis. Now, I know the statutory framework has not been in place in Scotland, but a voluntary framework has been in place for a, a good while now, and I've st still never been asked. My experience south of the border is different, I have been asked for periodical payment settlements, and we have done them south of the border. It's just not been a thing in Scotland. Okay, um, so there's, there's quite Kate a Donaghy, I think. Did you want to come in on that? Just to come quickly to see my experience is the same as Alan's. I've dealt for a long time with serious um, claims for serious injuries, and I have never been asked for a periodical payment order, and nor has it ever been raised even as an option or, or floated at any settlement discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, just. Further on the on the thirty year period, I mean, in the in health cases, you may, I mean, I think you just indicated you may have claims that are being settled for people whose life expectancy is really rather short, five years maybe. Yes, that can be the case. Um, does that add to the argument for having a bit more flexibility around the assumptions one makes about the period over which a portfolio will be invested, or not? Yes, it could do. I, I think from our point of view. What it means is that um, settling by PPO becomes even more um, Im important yep. because um, w because we all know that these life expectancy calculations can be wrong. And if we calculated a lump sum um, settlement on the basis of a predicted life expectancy of five years and the clinician's um, opinions were... You know, fortuitously proved wrong about that and the child in fact survived for another 10 years then there would be enormous um, gap in the um, compensation that was available to them so you know, again PPOs you know, always are, are the way to go in, the, in that situation and obviously that's compounded I guess when you change the discount rate because it, it, it may seem like a small percentage but it has a huge impact on the future value of a lump sum payment so the point Joy's making is that if if you've you've actually got it wrong, and you've given a, a lump sum based on a, on a on a negative discount rate, it could be a, a very high figure that then it, it, it ends up not actually doing the job it was meant to do because the the individual has died. Um, so I, I think the the change of a discount rate can have a major effect on on those lump sums, and and it makes it even more important for us to be able to impose periodical payment orders or for the court to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, do, does that mean that you think the review period suggested of three years uh, for review of the discount rate, um, when we get on to that, is um, too short? Because I think there's three, five or seven year periods suggested in the various submissions to this committee. What, what are your views on these, just very briefly, before we move on to questions to from John Mason? Uh, Alan Rogerson. Um, I would certainly advocate a five-year review period. Um, three years, in my experience, is a little too short. Th the reason I'm saying that is because it may be that in the run-up to a review that either party, either side, sees an advantage in holding off and not settling the case at that point in time because there's some perceived advantage of waiting to, to perhaps get uh, a more advantageous terms after a review period. So I think a five-year cycle would allow um, a more stable period in between times. Now, I know that is also allied with, um, I think there were some questions around how an injured person would choose to invest their damages and what sort of advice they would get, because obviously you would expect that to be reviewed annually if they had a managed portfolio. So 
But I, I strongly suggest that five years would be the way to go in that, to, to stop people trying to take advantage and delay settlement on the system or um, take advantage of the review period to, uh, for uncertainty. And, and Kate Donaghy. Just <clears throat> say that my experience in, in the lead-up to the, the change to the rate we now have, and since that rate was fixed with the consultations that are happening here and south of the border, it, it has impacted on litigation behaviour and, and it has made it more difficult to settle cases. So, although personal injury cases are managed on a timetable by the court, the more complicated cases take longer and there's a period where you might be waiting a year or, or even two for a court hearing and that's time that can be used between parties to negotiate a settlement. But if one party perceives there would be a benefit in waiting a year there's nothing really to stop them from doing that if they think they'll get more or less if they wait. And so it, it does have a material effect on the ability of of us, on our ability to settle cases. And so I, I, think, I think recently it was a 15-year period where yeah. the rate was not altered or changed. Um, would you agree that five-year is the appropriate length of time? Is seven too long? or I think five strikes the right balance. I, I think there are there are ups and downs to to, to to having a long period and a short period. I think five's a reasonable position to keep the rate relevant, but to avoid this distortion of the litigation process mm -hmm. that I think a three year rate might bring about. Right. I see Norma Shippen nodding in agreement. James Dalton, you're nodding <laughs> you're nodding in agreement now as well. Um, all right. Um, I'll turn now to John Mason. Hey, thanks very much, convener, and uh, I think to continue continue the theme of the discount rate, uh, we also have this factor, the further adjustment of half a percent. Now, on last week's panel, uh, we certainly had one witness that argued strongly that they felt that the pursuer is disadvantaged to start with, um, that they're taking on the risk of maybe living longer than they would be, that inflation is bound to be higher than uh, any rate we set because wages tend to go up faster and equipment costs tend to go up faster. So they were arguing that this half a percent is very much needed to kind of swing things back uh, towards the injured party. Uh, do I get the impression that you folk do not agree with that? James, uh, if, if I could start on that, maybe. Um, I think the problem <coughs> is that we've seen no evidence of the problem. Um, and, and I think in, in, in our submission, the... You can make a political and policy judgment about whether you want to overcompensate. And I think what the, the, the government's policy memorandum makes very clear is that they're seeking to achieve this 100% uh, principle of, of, comp of compensation, but then they have included within the framework for setting the discount rate this 0.5% further margin, which by definition overcompensates. Now, that's a political and policy choice. Uh, my, in my submission to you, that is a very blunt instrument with which to achieve that policy objective. And, and in our submission, what you, if, if you've made a decision that you want to err on the, on the side of overcompensation and you're being transparent about that, what, rather than using the very blunt 0.5% further margin deduction, what you could do is determine what the actuarially assessed rate is and then round that down to the nearest 0.25%. So that will provide you with overcompensation, but not to the extent of a, of a very, the very significant cost associated with a blunt 0.5% deduction. Okay. I mean, does it, Mr. Rogerson? Um, I would just add to that. If, if the portfolio is already overcautious, as we would submit, then, as James says, the extra 0.5 is quite a blunt instrument to then take it into overcompensation territory. And if there were to be overcompensation, then the cost would likely to be borne by insurance premium payers in Scotland, uh, businesses and the public sector alike. So I think it needs viewed and the, the two are very much aligned in terms of the portfolio and then the further adjustment. But I'm of the same opinion of James in, in that the 0.5% the, the seems quite a heavy handed way to go around changing rather than changing the portfolio. And yet, we do not seem to have any evidence as to whether people are being overcompensated or undercompensated, because nobody seems to have done a real study as to whether people ended up with money. So, I mean, it seems to me we're a bit in the dark on all of this. We are, and 
think as one of the panel members said it pre previously, we don't necessarily get to see what the injured person does with their mm -hmm. settlement as and when they get it, which to me would be the best evidence to help inform the committee as to exact investment behaviours of, of injured people. Mm -hmm. But for me, I always take it back to the, the availability of periodical payments and the fact that I've never been asked for one. So lump sums must be working for people. Now, we might not have that balance correct in terms of the discount rate or where we've got to so far, but people must want the flexibility of that lump sum, otherwise they wouldn't be asking for them. I mean, that, that, that strikes me as quite a big jump to say that it must be working because people haven't done something else. I mean, I mean if people run out of money late in life, there's not a lot they can do. Is no, there? no, I, I mean, it must be working that they're, they're choosing the lump sum, that they're not asking for periodical payments and no one has ever come to me yeah, asking well, for a periodical payment. I think payment. one of my colleagues is going to ask more about periodical payments, but... I think we're kind of given other evidence that people there were other reasons people wanted a, the the lump sum. Okay, on that one now, I suppose moving on from that then is the the whole question of the methodology of uh, calculating the discount rate and the plan is that the UK government actually will be a player in this, but also that the government could maybe change the notional portfolio. I mean, I'm an accountant. I quite like the idea that it could be completely automated. You know, that just we take people out of this and we look at what's the inflation rate, what's the guilt market doing, what's the equities doing, what's property doing, put a formula in place and then that formula just works its way through. Do we have to have people involved? Mr Dalton? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a decision for policymakers, I think. I mean... I, I suppose I'm, I'm a supporter of technology and technological advances. I'm slightly cautious about um, automating a process that will ultimately have such a profound impact on people's lives and people who are the most seriously injured people in society. I'd be very cautious about automating that process. And I think exercising human judgment in these decisions is probably, for now at least, the, the best place to remain. Okay. Everyone... Comfortable with that, are they? Ms. Donaghy? I suppose I, I would just say that the discussion that we're having today and the discussions that you've had around the discount rate highlight um, the difficulty of, of what it is you're doing when you fix a discount rate and, and nice and attractive though it might be to think you could automate that. I, d I think it's a, a difficult process that, that cannot be reduced to an arithmetical formula. Mm -hmm. I think it just wouldn't be possible. I mean, that would, should we go the other way then and make it, in a sense, more political or more accountable and just say, right, forget the actually let the, the government ministers and their advisers come up with the rate? I, th I think there should be involvement from the actual department. But I th I, Foyle's view is that there should be political accountability for a decision <clears throat> which will necessarily involve an element of political judgment when the rate's fixed. And do you reckon that accountability is here or isn't here? I think it's difficult to know how it will work in practice. The Scottish ministers retain the control in the current bill to fix a notional portfolio and, and to fix the standard adjustments, but the government actually would have the final say um, on what the figure is. I think it's not entirely clear, as matters stand, where the accountability for the decision would lie. Mm -hmm. OK. Mr Rogerson, did you want to come in? Yes, I was just going to say, uh, it's... England and Wales has went a slightly different route in that it's the Lord Chancellor with mm -hmm. a panel of special advisors will <coughs> specify the portfolio to the, the Government Actuaries Department, as I gather it. Whereas the approach that's been taken so far by the Scottish Government is the Scottish Government set the notional portfolio, the adjustments, and set the parameters for the Government's Actuaries Department. So it's really a question for the committee as to which direction you want to take it. And it's really a policy decision. Because bo both options might arrive at similar figures, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or they might completely depart in different different avenues. So you don't have strong feelings one way or the other, particularly? Not particularly, no. I, I think as long as we recognise what we're doing and what route we're going down and we do it for the right decisions, then mm -hmm. we've got to wait and see what transpires. OK, thanks so much. And, and do you feel there's any difficulty could arise from... Um, the paths diverging in Scotland and England? Um, possibly. You do have the situation where um, injured people, and uh, I'll draw the parallel back to draw down investors again, they're investing in the same market, and that market's UK-wide. So if you've got a dif different discount rate 
in England and Wales than you do in Scotland as an end result, then the, you might have uh, more cost being passed on to a uh, Scottish premium payer in the insurance market, or conversely, if the discount rate is lower in England and Wales, then England and Wales um, premium payers would be paying more. So you look at it more as a consequence of a different approach rather than something that in itself is a difficulty? It's not a difficulty, but I think you need to be mindful of the unintended consequences. Mm. I think Andy Whiteman wanted to come in on this point. It's yeah, just a brief supplementary on this. I mean, it's been mentioned before about um, insurance premium payers and taxpayers paying for this. Have you, have you got any figures on the percentage of the total insurance payouts or total compensation from health boards, uh, NHS, um, what percentage of that is, in fact, lump sums for pension injury claims? I certainly don't have any empirical evidence of that at all. I mean, my suggestion would be it would be tiny, and therefore any impact on consumers would be almost negligible. It's a, it's a very small proportion of the overall total of numbers, but you are dealing with the, the highest value claims at the other end of the spectrum, so it's very difficult to know exactly where the truth lies. I can certainly I can talk for my own company and my own employer has said as part of the whiplash reforms in England and Wales, they'll pass on all the savings back to the, the people paying the insurance premiums. But in terms of empirical evidence for what we pay out in claims in Scotland on the high value personal injury claims, I don't have that data, I'm afraid. Is it possible it, to find it out, even in broad terms? It, it might be something that um, the, the panel members could write into the committee if you do have that information. Um, if can, sorry, if we can get that information, I'm happy to write to the committee. Right, and I think that uh, goes for the others as well on the panel. I think we've given, we've given some information mm. to the committee about this. Part of the problem is that because there are a small number of claims, if we give the figures, it could potentially identify the person. Mm. So we're reluctant to actually give the actual figures on an annual basis, but we could do it over a... We, we've done it over a, a, a period of years. We could shorten that period of years mm. to five years, perhaps. Yes, if, if you could do it in an anonymised form, but yeah. so as to give, us, to give the committee some understanding of the answer to, to that particular mm. point. I don't <clears> know, Kate Donaghy, if you're, you would be in a position to comment on that, but perhaps if I can leave that with the, the panel members and uh, uh, indeed on any other question that uh, has been raised today, um, please don't hesitate to write and to add to, to what are the submissions you've put in already. Um, I'll come now to Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm going to ask one or two questions on PPOs, but first I just want to check on what I understand from something Joy Atherby said. You said that most of your uh, settlements are actually PPOs. Most of our high-value settlements. So the figures we've given you are for settlements over a million pounds. And um, have, you, have you got those? I think we do here, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the numbers are very, very small. But what those will show, for example, is that um, in 2016-17, we had one lump sum settlement over a million and two PPOs. In 2017-18, we had one lump sum settlement over a million pounds and two PPOs. So you, the, num the numbers are extremely small, but our, um, our desire is to settle these by PPOs. And there are a number you know, under negotiation at the current time. Am, am I correct in taking from what you said that it's mainly um, children yes. that fall into this category? Yes. For obvious reasons. Yes. And for the rest of the panel, there's very little experience of PPOs in Scotland. Is that correct? Can I just ask, some of the evidence that we've seen as a, over the last uh, period suggests that the regulatory regime for insurers makes it expensive to offer PPOs. Are there any issues with the regulatory regime that would uh, indicate that? So, so uh, as I was um, explaining in, in response to a, an earlier question, the, the way that uh, insurers have to reserve for their long-term liabilities is set out in a very different way from the way that the, the discount rate is set. And they hold capital based on those long-term liabilities. And 
and direct answer to your question. There's no problem with that regime. Um, insurers comply with that across Europe in terms of, of how they value those long-term liabilities and they put money onto their balance sheets to account for that to ensure that they are solvent and that their capital position is robust. So there's no problem with the regulatory regime. Just add to that. Um, I think there was some evidence last week that there may be a problem with insurers and solvency and, and, and how it's backed. Insurers that underwrite business in the UK are, are subject to the FSCS rules and the guarantee. So essentially there wouldn't be a problem with an insurance company. If an insurance company wasn't able to fulfil the PPO and went bust, then the government would step in and replace that, so perhaps the Motor Insurers Bureau. So that's one aspect where you, you perhaps need to look at the bill, because I don't think the Motor Insurers Bureau are named as a compensator for the purpose of periodical payments at the moment. Um, but I, th I think despite any perceived issues over the insurance industry and whether we like PPOs or don't like PPOs or whatever, I don't think that's necessarily the right question. The right question is what's the right thing to do for injured people? And an injured person going to court and asking for a periodical payment, I find it very difficult to envisage a situation where the court wouldn't have sympathy with that injured person and wouldn't give them the periodical payment they were looking for. And it's not really for an insurance company to try and argue against that or intervene because there doesn't seem any rational reason to do so. In fact, you've just touched on something I was going to be asking anyway, which is relating to the bill's requirement for uh, reasonable security, uh, you know, enough to keep the continuing payment going. Now, you talked about insurance companies, and obviously there's backing there, and probably any court would say that a properly constituted insurance company would uh, give reasonable security. But there are other bodies, I mean, maybe even the NHS, for example, would a court other bodies that the court would not see as being able to supply that reasonable security. So Alan makes a very important point about the context of the Motor Insurers Bureau. So uh, a, a number of, of claims are settled as a result of accidents uh, with uninsured drivers. Uh, and the Motor Insurers Bureau settles a number of those cases on a PPO basis. Um, so what we would appreciate if in this legislation is that rather than the MIB needing to go to court every time it wants to settle a case to demonstrate to the court that it has got the solvency and it's got the capital to provide that PPO on a long-term basis, we would like the MIB to be deemed as, in the same way an insurance company is, um, able to provide that claim. Uh, pay that claim, sorry. Sure. We'll certainly note that point. Are there any other uh, organisations that uh, might not fall under this uh, uh, reasonable security test? I can't think of one because it would ultimately be an insurance company or a government agency, in which case it's backed by the government in any event. So I'm, I'm struggling to think of a single example that wouldn't be covered. There used to be something that was... We used to have a thing called structured settlements a number of years ago before PPOs uh, came in in their current format. And in the days of the trusts, I don't know if you remember the NHS trusts, there used to be a considerable amount of discussion about whether that would be something that would continue into the future, and indeed they didn't. But I think it was always recognised by pursuers' agents that there would be some mechanism of payment for, for a health service organisation or a government organisation. But it even was a question, I think, that we used to have to field. So I could see it would be an issue for some other defenders and probably their, the pursuers' agents. Just, just to tie, tie off my question on the regulatory regime, are there any barriers there to insurers offering a practical barrier to PPOs being offered? from a regulatory or other point of view? The only other aspect to bear in mind is the indemnity limits of a, a policy. So an employer's liability policy or a public liability policy will have an, an inbuilt limit. Um, that would be the only possible barrier, but then that would be a barrier in any event because after that indemnity limit, then it's essentially uh, a private businesses 
mm. uh, money or a private individual's money in some respects as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Gordon MacDonald. Convener. I want to continue this um, discussion on about PPOs, but in um, <clears throat> particular about the variation of PPOs at a future date. Um, we've heard this morning that PPOs could reduce the chance of somebody being over or undercompensated, that uh, it brings a bit of certainty in the fact that somebody's life expectancy could change at a, f a future date, so PPOs would be helpful to ensure that they get the award that they require. So would I, given that degree of certainty, would I be right in saying there are no concerns about <coughs> um, courts varying PPOs? that you need to be very clear in the guidance as to what particular circumstances you would envisage that people could go back to the court to, to change or amend the PPO because one of the advantages about settling a case is that you achieve certainty for both the defender and the pursuer and so if it becomes if the I think it would be written to the agreement you know, when those circumstances might arise but I think it would be I think it would be important to have some kind of degree of certainty about when those situations might, and what, what kind of situation you envisage might arise, not just the general run of cases. What, what would you think those, those uh, changes could be? I suppose if somebody became unexpectedly more severely damaged, that mm. there might be some event that took place in their life that was a consequence of the original negligence that hadn't been foreseeable mm -hmm. at the time of the PPO coming into play, that's the sort of thing that So should there be a list of trigger points then? Well, it would be helpful if there were, was some kind of list of trigger points. You wouldn't want to think it would be done by every pursuer in every case on a regular basis because th the whole point of having the discussions and the agreement at the outset is that you try and, and, and foresee mm -hmm. you know, matters that could arise. Mm -hmm. Anybody else might come in? Yeah. We already have a system um, of provisional damages, uh, which is used in the mean when, when we're looking at people who have um, developed a disease um, from exposure to something perhaps at work and they have a relatively minor condition which would indicate they have been exposed, but there's a risk that in the future they will develop a more serious condition. And the provisional damages uh, regime allows them to have some compensation now for the relatively minor condition, but reserve their right to come back to seek damages in the future if they do develop a more serious condition. And FOIL submission is that the wording in relation to PPOs and their variation should mirror the wording for provisional damages, because there has been a, a fair amount of argument in court about what a significant deterioration or improvement means. And if you tied it to that wording, you're benefiting from what's already been done before. I think the legislation also envisages that you would write into the agreement things that might change life expectancy or, or need for care that would restrict the scope for someone either side coming back again and again and trying to change what's already been agreed. I think there are ways to, to manage that and, and to make it acceptable. Mm -hmm. It might even be that it's not... Um it's not for primary legislation to consider that. It may be that the Scottish Civil Justice Council in secondary legislation or rules of court can take account of this. Uh, but I, I do understand that obviously it's for the committee to make sure that the, the headline legislation is fit for purpose and enables all this to take place. Mm. So, so given that <clears throat> there might be an individual whose illness unforeseen progressively gets worse, as, as you suggested, Kate, um, who should pick up the fees if it goes back to court? I think that's, again, something that is going to be in the detail. But if someone is compensated because they have been harmed by someone else's fault, mm. then, you know, on a very broad brush basis, it seems right. The person who's caused the harm should pay the cost mm. of that. I think the concern would be you, you could have a vexatious person who keeps bringing someone back to court. And I think in those circumstances, you would need to look at safeguarding the defender in those circumstances but that is really something for the, the detail of rules court rules and in terms of it was it was mentioned last week quarks qualified one week cost shifting which is coming in the the detail of that system is currently being looked at by the scottish civil justice council 
And so this is something they could also look at. And I think the detail that would need to be there would be appropriate for the Rules Council to look at. Okay. Anybody else? No? Okay, thanks very much. Um, ju just to pick up on that last point that you made, Kate Donaghy, I'm just looking at your uh, FOIL submission to the committee. Um, I think you're referring to the issue about Section 2E2A in the bill, and you've said to change the wording to the current wording, significant improvement or serious de deterioration, rather than, I think, the wording in the bill, a change in the pursuer's physical or mental condition. And is that because if there's a new wording, then the courts will have to determine what that means, and then we go through the process of establishing the meaning of it, whereas the existent wording is already understood. That's correct. So there's, there's been work done to, to interpret those words, um, and I think it would be useful to use that, that work and that time that, that's been spent on that, rather than trying to start again with this bill. But on the other hand, I think you also accept it could be something that the, the Rules Council could deal with. Is that right? or I think it's going to be. I think if the wording reflected the provisional damages wording, then people know broadly what, what they're dealing with and the level of change that would be required to justify bringing something to court, how the expenses situation works with that and any sanctions for people being vexatious on either side, I think that level of detail is, f is for the Rules Council to determine. Right, so, so your primary position is this is something that should be uh, made clear in the bill as opposed to left to the Rules Council? I think the wording, the description of the, the change in circumstances, it would be helpful if it mirrored the Administration of Justice Act in relation to provisional damages. I think the detail beyond that, it would make sense for that to be determined by the Scottish Civil Justice Council. Right, thank you. Any other questions from committee members? If not, um, we have a, a little bit of time, so I don't know if each of you wants to s state uh, sort of in one or two sentences the, the key points that you uh, think we should, uh, as a committee, take away from you. On the other hand, you may not wish to because you may uh, feel that's uh, limiting too much what you said and you've put in your submissions, but... Uh, would anyone like to make any final comment to the committee on any particular point in the bill that either we've covered or not covered today? Nothing from anyone. Right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming in, and I'll suspend the meeting to allow a change of our witnesses.
Well, welcome back to our session this morning. We now turn to look at the Subordinate Legislation Common Financial Tools Scotland Regulations 2018. And we're joined today by David Hilferty, Deputy Chief Executive of Money Advice Scotland. Welcome to you. Um, Eileen McLean, National Council Member for R3 in Scotland. Uh, David Menzies, Director of Practice ICAS, and Craig Simmons, Sector Coordination Manager of Money Advice Service. So welcome to all <coughs> four of you this morning. Thank you for coming in. Um, the microphones will be operated by the sound desk, so no need to push any buttons. If you want to come in, just raise your hand to indicate that to me. Uh, no need to answer every question, but uh, please feel free to contribute to the discussion as we move to committee members' questions, starting now with Angela Constance. Good morning to the panel. Uh, I have uh, three questions that are essentially um, to explore the, the desire for a common financial tool and some of the uh, pros and cons um, around that. So. Can I uh, ask the panel that given that uh, one of the key arguments for the adoption of the uh, standard financial statement is that it will standardise the assessment of income uh, across the UK, uh, how important do you think this is and what impact will that have in debtors of having stricter limits on expenditure? Uh, and I don't mind who starts. <coughs> Kick off then. Um, I represent R3 and it's our members as insolvency practitioners who will be putting the um, SFS into practical practice on appointment um, and obviously the basis of the regulations. I think the R3 position is that it is definitely preferable to have a standard. One of the difficulties up until the introduction of CFS was that there was a number of different standards out there. Some firms would use um, British Banking Association, some would use what was then triple CS, some would use none at all, they would have an individual. And what we're really aiming for with CFT or now SFS is a common platform of analysis. And we've had that in Scotland for uh, a number of years now. SFS is UK wide and again, I think um, preferable to have something like that. The fact that we have different solutions north and south of the border in terms of debt solutions is well recognised, but the majority of the creditor organisations are now based predominantly in Manchester. A lot of them are based elsewhere in the UK. And um, so when individuals are getting debt advice, it's not geographic specific as to where that advice is coming from. And it also then means that where the majority of your creditor organisations, the big commercial lenders, are also spread across the UK, <coughs> predominantly down south, there's a common platform that they recognise. We have had issues in the past where they didn't necessarily recognise a Scottish-specific approach because they just didn't see it on a sufficient uh, basis to be familiar with it. So the FS SFS across a UK basis would definitely support that um, ease of use um, for everybody and a common platform for advice. Okay. Uh, before we move on to other panel members, um, Ms McLean, is it therefore your view uh, that SFS will be accepted by more creditors? Arguably, yes. Okay. Uh, other members of the panel? I think just similar to Eileen, you know, I think the, the, the principle of a common financial tool is one that uh, we would generally support. Um, I think broadly across the UK, it makes sense to have uh, a similar method of, of, of calculation. Um, when the, the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Act or, or bill was being discussed within uh, Parliament, this was, I guess, the first time that the common financial tool was, was brought in. Um, and we certainly you know, suggested at that point that actually neither at that point, the, the, the common financial uh, statement probably wasn't the right method uh, to use it in the first place. There is always a, a discretionary element, I think, uh, needed, and uh, we would prefer to see something which was uh, less administrative uh, of a burden uh, and something that was just a, a bit more generic around those those tools. But we can perhaps uh, explore that uh, further on if, if that's of interest to the committee. Okay, and other other members? I think, go, on, go on, Dave. After you, Craig. Oh, thank you both. Good morning, and thank you also for inviting us to speak out. 
I'm Craig, I work for the Money Advice Service and we kind of are the owners of the, of the uh, Standard Financial Statement. And it's worth just mentioning the Standard Financial Statement has been built on the good practice of what's already in existence in the sector. So there's something called the Common Financial Statement, which is currently in the Common Financial Tool. There's an approach that Step Change use that a lot of insolvency practitioners also use across the UK. And there are various other approaches used to assessing affordability when people are in problem debt. And what we try to do is take what's worked well in all of those uh, other existing formats. And we've learned a huge amount, actually, from what's happened up in Scotland. Uh, the savings category is a, a prime example of that, actually, where some of it's worked here and, a, and a, an example of something that's been built into the standard financial statement. And I think the main thing to stress about the impact on debtors is, is what happens at the minute if you go to uh, a step change in Scotland, for example, or a Christian against poverty who are UK-wide, um, you'll be assessed using one format and one set of spending guidelines that are different to what's used by the AIB here. And the standard financial statement means that there'll only be one approach to that across the debt advice sector. And why I think that's really important for clients is that um, if you go one place and you're assessed using one method, the output may be slightly different to what ends up being in your common financial tool output. And I don't think that's a great customer experience to have that change. You may go to a different provider who can provide that particular solution, an, an IP, for example, who would say, well, actually, the spending guidelines in this format is different to the one in the one that's been used previously. So it, it should reduce burden on both advice providers and solvency practitioners, but most importantly for me, on clients who are in their hour of need, who need a seamless journey. OK, thank you, Craig. Uh, David? Yeah, we, we view this from the perspective of our members, our frontline money advisors, who are dealing with the tool on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I think if you pitch that same question at our members, the resounding response you'd get back from them is that we've already had standardised assessment of income since the introduction of the CFT in 2015. So what they are more likely to view this as a question of is how important is it that we replace our existing standardised assessment of income with a new standardised assessment of income, uh, which isn't nearly as tested as the current system, and which we've got concerns is going to lead uh, to more work through the additional evidence requirements. And the evidence requirements is something that you know, they touch on throughout this session, but I, th I think that's where we've got a practical difference for clients in Scotland compared to clients in England and Wales. The approach from the accounting bankruptcy in Scotland uh, means that the evidence requirements are more onerous than elsewhere. Now, what we've got with the standard financial statement is moving of certain categories so that they will always be evidenced. Those categories include transport, they include school uniform costs, they include uh, the cost of school trips, things that are difficult to evidence. So that would be the viewpoint of our members and, and that would be some of the sort of impacts on clients and debt that start to emerge uh, when we transition towards uh, this new uh, but second standardised assessment of income. Okay, uh, thank you for that. So, following on from uh, David Hilferty's uh, point of view, I mean, Kate McLean had, uh, and her contribution, um, acknowledged that uh, UK creditors already have to adapt to specifically Scottish uh, processes. So, I suppose, um, and I'll put this question to, to David um, Hilferty first, uh, does it make a practical difference if Scottish statutory debt solutions uh, use a different uh, income uh, assessment method. And I think you began to uh, touch upon yeah. that. The, the, the first thing I would say is when I speak to our members, when I speak to our money advisors, the difficulty that they have in dealing with creditors isn't with your conventional consumer creditors, which, as I said, are based throughout the UK. Uh, consumer creditors, banks, lenders, uh, credit card firms and so on, uh, they have numerous approaches in place to deal with customers who are considered vulnerable, uh, customers in low income, and advisors will tell you that dealing with these types of creditors is relatively straightforward for the most part. Where the difficulty often arises is in dealing with what you might refer to as public sector creditors, and dealing with DWP, and dealing with HMRC, uh, and primarily in dealing with uh, local authorities who uh, often recover council tax arrears uh, pretty aggressively. So the notion that previously advisors 
have had problems trying to negotiate with consumer creditors is not something that our members would necessarily recognise. Turning to your second point about the impact on statutory solutions, when you're going through a statutory solution, uh, the evidence requirements that need to be backed up within the financial statement, as I've said, can be onerous in many cases. I mean, we, we've seen examples of cases where uh, a father who didn't live with his daughter was asked to, or his expenditure to visit his daughter or by train fare was considered excessive. We've seen examples of a disabled client who was asked to evidence uh, expenditure on incontinence pads. Now, these are issues that you don't necessarily have uh, elsewhere in the UK, but that we do have as part of our approach to statutory solutions in Scotland. Now, what the SFS does is it moves, as I said, elements like transport and school uniform costs into categories which must be evidenced. Uh, and that wasn't previously the case in CFS. That's before we even start to talk about trigger, trigger figure breaches. Uh, so in that sense, there's an increased workload on advisors, on clients, and on the AIB as well, for that matter, uh, unless we get a position where there's a, a reasonable approach to guidance. And in that case, that would alleviate a lot of our concerns in that area around these evidence requirements. OK. I want to put the same question to uh, the, the, the rest of the panel, and perhaps they could also uh, comment about the issue around public uh, sector, whether it's local authorities or DWP, dealing with uh, these public sector bodies as creditors. I think the wider issue is that, from a creditor's perspective, if you have no standard whatsoever, we go back to a scenario where there's a huge subjective overview and what you have are individual creditors, whether they're local authority, um, small traders, who will express an opinion on a debtor spend and you know we will get down to whether they should have sky telly, whether they should smoke, whether they're allowed to go and visit their daughter, um, what, they what they're spending their money on. At the end of the day, there's all sorts of privacy issues uh, and debt is not a crime you know and what we're really aiming for here is a standard of living so if you set a standard against which the average is then benchmarked and and we'll come back to trigger figures as long as you have some kind of benchmark it's actually harder for for creditors to argue because you're using a standard against which everybody is measured on a common basis okay thank you david menzies yeah, again, I think, you know, similar to, to, to David there, I think it's the the level of evidence requirements that, that that's the onerous part of this at the moment. I think it does make absolute sense for uh, everyone to be to be assessed in a common way, in a, in a standard way with, within a defined framework. Um, in terms of UK creditor positions, I think, you know, they, they're well used to, to dealing with uh, slightly different um, nuances of Scots law and the slightly different uh, procedures that we that we have. Um, and I think particularly around the assessment of uh, contributions, uh, it certainly benefits them to be able to do that on a common ba uh, basis across the UK, whether it's somebody entering into an IVA in England and Wales or Northern Ireland, or somebody entering into a trust deed or a, um, a debt arrangement scheme arrangement in Scotland. If there's that sort of commonality across across the, the, the board there, it's certainly beneficial for them where they have a discretion as to whether they want to uh, permit that debtor to, to go into that solution or whether they, they don't. Um, they're able to assess that far, far easier then. Okay, yep. thank you. Craig Simmons? Um, if I may just pick on three of the points that I've heard there, and, and Dave is absolutely right that Scotland's already leading the way in sort of commonality of approach in formal solutions, but it's worth me stressing to the committee that there's, of course, still non-formal solutions operating in Scotland, such as informal debt management plans, sort of token payment agreements with creditors. And actually moving to a standard financial statement brings that consistency across the board for people in debt, whether they're going for a formal solution or a less formal solution. The point also around evidencing of trigger free figure breaches I think is certainly going to come up more during this discussion but I must touch on the reasons why travel, things like prescription costs, um, sort of school meals have come into what we would call the fixed expenditure costs and forgive me if I'm telling the committee what they already know, um, coming to the fixed committee costs is that there's no trigger figure to those, they're viewed as essential expenditure and they wouldn't be subject to challenge by creditors. Um, 
the challenge would be around the more discretionary areas of expenditure. Mm. So I see that as a very positive thing for clients who don't have to then have the spending guideline pursued against things like their bus fare or what have you. Um, and the final point on public sector creditors, um, I can only really reflect on the experience we've seen down in England and Wales. Um, Standard Financial Statement has been in operation since the 1st of March 2017 there, and we've had just over 100 local authorities in England and Wales who have signed up to express an interest, and I must be clear with the committee here, express an interest in <coughs> using the Standard Financial Statement as their approach to assessing affordability, and a number of those have actually now implemented it. The rest are uh, investigating that. And we also sit on a Cabinet Office Fairness Group, which has the likes of DWP and HMRC upon it. And that is a key topic of the agenda at the minute, actually, having a consistent approach to public sector debts mm -hmm. as well, actually. So I'm very encouraged, actually, that the, the momentum the SFS is building. And I would expect, if it's implemented in Scotland, that would only continue. OK. And my, my final question is, um convener is, um, is the panel confident uh, that the SFS will be accepted uh, by UK government bodies? Uh, and if, the, alternatively, if the, the common financial statement um, was to be continued in Scotland, uh, who would maintain it? And whether it's common financial statement or SFS, what are the issues around uh, any assessments, costs, bureaucracy for those that are providing advice? Um, and um, I'll maybe just start with, with, with you, uh, Craig, yeah, that's if that's all right. So, of course, um, there's a few examples where the UK government have already accepted the use of SFS. Um, you know, one example would be the insolvency service in England and Wales use it to assess bankruptcy already and have done since April 2017. Uh, they're very positive about the standard financial statement. Um, it's in the pre-action protocol in the court system down south as well. And I should also mention yesterday, in, with, along with the budget papers, the, the Treasury published plans for a, a statutory debt management plan, which would be similar to the DES up here in Scotland. And they reference use of standard financial statement in that. So I, I have no doubt that it is well supported um, more broadly in the UK, certainly. And sorry, I forgot what the, the second question was. Um, it, it was about whether if who, who would maintain uh, uh, the other yes. system if it was continued. Um, so currently it's maintained by a charity called the Money Advice Trust. This is the common financial statement. Um, now they have indicated um, that they intend to cease the common financial statement if everyone goes on to SFS, of course. Um, I believe they'd be seeking funding to do that if they want to continue it. At the minute, we will fund the standard financial statement. Uh, that will be of no cost to anyone but ourselves. OK, okay thank you. Uh, David Menzies, have you anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to agree in terms of the, the adoption of SFS by, by UK government departments. I think it is broadly uh, well supported, etc. Uh, I, I think the question of maintenance of common financial statement, if, if, if that was maintained within, within Scotland, I think we need to understand the, the, the basics in behind it, I guess, is, you know, fundamentally it is a, a, a model where um, categories of expenditure are, are allocated against uh, a model, essentially. Those figures are, are, are taken from ONS uh, stats at the moment, household expenditure. So in terms of the actual maintenance, I, I don't think that's a, a huge deal in terms of you know just taking whatever ONS figures are there and putting it into the, the appropriate format because it's a formatting issue rather than anything else. Um, you know, SFS and CFS as is, is using the same things but just with categories of expenditure in slightly different areas. Um, so I, I, I don't really see actually maintenance of CFS would be a tremendous burden going forward, um, and I would, you know, I don't know who's best to, to, to pick that up, whether it be the accountant in bankruptcy uh, or, or or some other public body um, out of that. So, yeah. Okay, thank you, Eileen uh, McLean. If you have anything to add that's not been said already, um, just in terms of who might do it, I mean, I know there is an argument through the AIB supporting that. There is arguably, however, a bit of a conflict of interest there because they would be setting the standard and then monitoring and uh, implementing in certain cases. So perhaps somebody completely independent who would, as David says, take some of the wider economic figures and put that into the model. 
perhaps Fraser Valander Institute was a kind of an obvious one that I thought of, or um, a different government agency or department, maybe the Economic uh, Directorate, for example. So that there would be a, a degree of uh, separation between the setting of the standard and then the implementation. It crossed my mind that that would be quite important. Okay, thank you. And uh, David Hilferty? Yeah, nothing, nothing much to add from what the, the panel said already in terms of who would maintain it, but what I would emphasise is that if you're if the spending guidelines are broadly in line between CFS and SFS, then, then what, what we've got there is really a distinction without too much difference. But if you're persuaded that there's certain drawbacks and, and flaws within SFS, then you'll also find that within the CFS. For example, there's no transparency under either option in the relationship between the client, the creditors and advisors. The client's the, the only person hasn't had access to those spending guidelines. I, I don't know if the panel, if the committee, sorry, have had access to, to the guidelines. But what preventing members of the public uh, from seeing these guidelines does for me is it, it helps contribute to that notion and that misconception that people in debt somehow can't be trusted, that if they could access these guidelines, that they're somehow going to game the system. Uh, as Eileen said already, uh, being in debt isn't a crime and we need to change a lot of the misconceptions around people in debt. We're also concerned that under both options, there's no real contingency. And it's 10% of disposable income capped at 20%. Now, if you're paying £50 per month towards your debt, then you've got £5 disposable income uh, contingency slack there to play with. Uh, it's, it's just not sufficient to deal with unexpected expenditure. I know that we mentioned, Eileen mentioned living standards and, and David mentioned as well the methodology that underpins both CFS and SFS. It's based on the spending <coughs> patterns within the bottom 20% of households in ONS living costs and food survey. Now, I frequently made the case that if you base it on what the bottom 20% are spending it, then you're basing it on people who are spending what they have rather than what they need. And that seems to me to be the wrong starting point. Now, I'm fully aware that the decision here is almost a straight shootout between continuing CFS and SFS, but what we'd really like to see going forward is a full review of potential alternatives uh, and also a review of the guidance that interprets these regulations. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Bailey. I wonder, just on that last point, whether we couldn't, as a committee, request sight of that guidance. I think <laughs> it would be useful in our deliberations. Um, I wonder whether I could be slightly cheeky, because David spoke about his network of money advice um, advisors. Um, when did you, each of you, in turn, last provide face-to-face -face advice to a debtor using one of these common financial tools? David, we start with you. I am not, uh, I've never been a frontline money advisor. Uh, I was appointed as a policy officer at Money Advice Scotland, okay. but I'm very much uh, somebody who always thought that policy officers shouldn't remain in the office and, and have their heads stuck in books <coughs> and legislation. At Money Advice Scotland, uh, we work to the maximum that if you assert something without evidence, it can be dismissed without evidence. So we put evidence at the very heart of, it, of all that we do. Our analysis of the CFS and SFS has been based on really close engagement with our members. We've had three consultation events. Uh, we've had uh, different uh, engagements throughout the country in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen. Uh, we also went through the rather laborious uh, task of line for line taking CFS financial statements and transposing it into the new standard financial statements. So, uh, Whilst you're absolutely correct to say that uh, I don't have frontline advice experience, uh, the level of engagement that we've uh, had with our members, I hope, goes some way uh, to make up for that. Okay. Sorry, Those are people who do give frontline advice. Yes. Uh, okay. Our members Sorry. are money yeah. advice providers in uh, local authorities, cabs, uh, mm. housing associations, as well as uh, some IPs in the private sector as well. Eileen McLean. Likewise, uh, our members are the members giving advice. My role without going into too much detail, is slightly more complicated. <laughs> and I teach the insolvency profession, so on a regular basis, working with CF, CFS in terms of how it works. Thank you. David Menzies? Uh, I'm currently advising a debtor 
uh, at this moment. So the last time I actually used uh, the common financial statement was uh, last week. Good. So, okay. yeah. And Craig Simmons? No, it's a good question. I, I'm not a, a regulated debt okay. advisor, but I, I must stress, um, you know, the standard financial statement as an idea has been around since about 2013, it, it, 40. It, Okay. It, it's not the idea, it's no. whether you have practical experience of applying it, because I think that is the nub of it. You know, I've heard today people agree that there should be a common financial framework. Okay. The question is, which one and how does it work and whose interests is it in? So, you know, I just I wanted to be a bit cheeky and ask that question. Um, let me come on to something more substantive. Um, clearly conflicting views between the accountant in bankruptcy and at least Money Advice Scotland, if, if not others, as to whether the use of the standard financial statement will result in more or fewer trigger figure breaches. What are your views? And I'll come to David Menzies first, seeing it was only last week. Yep. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, without, uh, I, I guess, prejudging what David might say, I don't think actually there is a, a, a huge difference in terms of the IB and, and Money Advice Scotland's uh, view of that. I, I think there is commonality in, in terms of the view that there will be increased trigger figure breaches um, using the SFS. I think the question is by how much and how many, okay? Um, so I'm sure David will, will talk about this in a, in a bit more detail, but the analysis that was carried out by the AIB in relation to the consultation uh, was carried out prior to uh, the SFS trigger figures being up, uprated. Um, and, you know, it, it, it showed around about 12% of uh, debtor contribution orders would result in a trigger figure breach being increased. Um, the initial comparative survey that Money Advice Scotland carried out, that, that percentage was about 40%. Okay. Since the figures were, were upgraded, the Money Advice Service re uh, established that evidence and that came out about 4% of bankruptcies would result in increased trigger figure breaches. So I think there, there, there's commonality across the board saying there will be additional trigger figure breaches, there will be additional evidential requirements, and you know that, that that's just the way it is. Um, you know, so really, I think that that that's where things are, are standing at the moment. Okay, but David, would David, you like to update us? Yeah, I, th I think it is important to stress that the initial AIB consultation took place, I think, back in October Sorry. last year, or at least closed in October last year. Uh, an argument around trigger figure guidelines has certainly moved on a lot since then. In fact, since then, there's been two separate up ratings uh, to the spending guidelines within SFS since then. And I think a huge amount of credit is due to Craig and his colleagues at Money Advice Service for that. Uh, we, were, uh, we were at the forefront of raising these concerns. There was a response to those concerns. In certain trigger categories, the guideline has increased by more than 100%. It is worth noting, however, that in the I think it was the, the, the last up rating in 2017, so the SFS guidelines have increased, the CFS guidelines have come down slightly, and, and that's why we've got this picture, as much as anything else, of a set of guidelines that's broadly more equivalent. Uh, when we asked uh, Money Vice Trust why the CFS guidelines had come down, which seems somewhat perplexing. I mean, your household bills haven't come down in, in the last year or so, have they? What they said, and again, it comes back to the methodology, people in that bottom income quintile uh, were registered as spending less. They were spending less because they had less. Because they had less, the CFS guidelines came down accordingly. Now, that's another one of the, the, the drawbacks that we see in the current methodology. And again, I'd emphasise that's whether we're using CFS or whether we're using SFS. Okay. Could, could I just add, actually, when CFS came in, that the number of individuals making contributions plummeted. So um, at between 50 and 75% of um, debtors in our insolvency solution at that time went from paying a contribution to no contribution. So the fact that we're now going back to just 4%, arguably, or 4 to 12%, making a slightly increased contribution um, I would just like to put that in context. And finally, Craig. Um, I was only, getting praise there. No, well, thank you, David, uh, particularly for that. Um, I don't have a lot to add to what David said. The only thing I would mention is 
it's very difficult to compare precisely common financial statement to standard financial statement. The best, what I see as most reliable is what's happened where it's been live in England and Wales and none of the providers who are using it uh, south of the border have reported any problems and any particular increase in trigger figure breaches. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, may I just ask, um, in terms of allowable expenditures, that um, graded according to region or area, that sort of thing? Um, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, no, the spending guidelines that are attached to three areas of expenditure are UK-wide spending guidelines, and it, it's all tied up with the, the standardisation of this format that it will be used UK-wide. The key thing to stress on that is that it's within the guidelines and guidance for SFS that clearly there'll be areas where, take very rural areas, for example, where there may be higher expenditure, where sp spending guidelines are breached, there should be a note added to the statement and where there's a good reason that should be accepted. And that tends to be the practice that we've seen thus far. So is it ad hoc dependent on the, the individual, the location, whether or not? It's designed, that flexibility of the process is, is designed into it. So it takes into account your domestic situation, um, the type of house that you live in, the, the fuel, so that certain categories are not uh, have an upper limit and are not triggered as a result, for example, fuel, heating, um, that kind of thing. And it's dependent on the number of adults and the number of children that live in a property. It's, it's a concern that we've certainly raised, uh, particularly in response to the additional cost of living in remote and rural Scotland. Uh, and while Eileen said that, and I know Craig mentioned this about transport costs and energy costs, they're not triggered categories. But there are categories that if you're submitting a statutory application to AIB have to be evidenced in every case, whether or not that spending is considered excessive. Now, and I, I think we need to look at the wider context of the money advice sector at the moment. Investment from local authorities and money advice services has dropped by 45% in the last two years. What we need is money advisors on the front line advising clients we don't need them chasing up fuel bills. We don't need them chasing up uh, bus tickets to submit as part of the application. So is the proposal better from the point of view of taking into account regional differences as applied in individual yeah. cases or not? I, I, I think purely in terms of comparison between the CFS and the SFS, it broadly doesn't make any difference. Both are, are, are done on uh, the same figures, essentially the same source figures. There is no regional variation in that, but both of them allow uh, a degree of flexibility or uh, rationalisation for individual circumstances. But I think that then comes back to the, you know, the original principle, which is actually going to one debt advisor, you should get the same result as going to, to, to any other one. Um, and I'm not convinced that under either the CFS or the FSS, you actually get that because some people do allow something you know whether it be cigarettes or the degree of travel you know that, that 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 rationale around well actually how much is too much travel to go and visit your daughter or, or or whatever that doesn't get away from either the cfs or the sfs that judgment is is still built in as part of those and i think what i would just add to that is that the the point isn't necessarily which tool we use it's how we implement it and there is a, there's definitely, I think we're all in agreement, a wider discussion about the level of confirmation and evidential requirements that uh, go into supporting that, both in terms of a cost, both to the money advice sector, to the insolvency profession, um, and the level of evidence that the accountant in bankruptcy who oversees the implementation of this, um, and certainly from a sequestration point of view, sets the contributions um, whether uh, there is work to be done there. I know from sitting in an R3 capacity in the bankruptcy stakeholder group that that has been fed back to AIB regarding the level of evidence and um, I advise that that is something that they're looking at. Right, thank you. And now Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Just a, a very simple question, actually, maybe building on some of the information you've already given us. What is the likely administrative impact on money advisors and insolvency practitioners of a switch to the standard financial statement? 
Can you speak to that? I think, as, as I've sort of indicated uh, already, there is a large evidential requirement, which is really that burden uh, as a result of the operation, the way that the, the accountant bankruptcy uh, operate it and require that evidence. Those were concerns you know, that, are, that are in place, whether it is the common financial statement or the, or the standard financial statement. I don't think either of them uh, is going to, to uh, increase the administrative burden uh, an awful lot, other than, as I say, in relation to the the trigger figure breaches, where there does appear to be clear evidence that there is an increase in the number of trigger figures that will be breached. So there will be a, an additional administrative uh, burden in terms of evidencing that. The discussion back and forward between the, the AIB, the insolvency practitioner or debt advisor and the debtor around obtaining that evidence and justifying why those, th those breaches are there. Um, you know, we, we've done, based on the analysis carried out by the AIB and uh, Money Advice Scotland, we are conservatively estimating that that cost to the UK economy, or the, the economy in Scotland, I guess, uh, is somewhere between 155,000 and 450,000 per year, um, depending upon which, which range of breaches it is that, 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 that you're looking at. So there, there undoubtedly is a cost to this. Is there other costs, for example, systems changes that have got to be made and so forth? Because I would imagine there, you know, there's some sort of uh, bespoke uh, system or software would need to be in place. There certainly will be some uh, change. It depends on, on each organisation, I guess, how they operate. Um, Money Advice Service provide uh, an Excel template spreadsheet. So some places will use that. The accountant and bankruptcy have uh, built into their systems, into, into basis, uh, the, the common financial uh, statement, which will have to be updated. So undoubtedly there's IT costs there. Some other uh, practices, step change and uh, such like, again, they'll need to, to invest in IT changes as well, yep. If we're talking about back office costs, um, you seem to be indicating, unless I'm misinterpreting, that they'll be fairly minor. Relatively minor. It's it's in the context, yeah. But it is still a cost. The, the question is whether that, that cost is, is justified or not. What's relatively minor? Well, we're not talking about millions. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We're talking about millions. No, I'm saying we're, no, we're, we're, not. we're not talking okay. about millions. No. <laughs> okay. Does any other member of the panel have a view on that? I'll just pick up on the insolvency point. Being an insolvency practitioner and keeping abreast of the myriad changes, we have the new insolvency Scotland rules coming, for example, we have to just absorb that cost as a, as a cost of doing business. And I would suggest that most of the IPs have already um, are on board with this. Um, yes, there's lots of things we can do to talk directly to AIB systems, but they're not a significant cost to the IP community. Oh, I got Implementation costs would vary by organisation, as, as Dave has already said. What's universal, though, is uh, the potential for additional costs day-to-day -day when it's in operation through these additional evidence requirements. And that's where, if we can get good guidance uh, around the proposals, then so some of those concerns will be mitigated. The only thing I have to add to that, I, I disagree with what David is saying. I don't believe there is any evidence that there will be additional uh, burden between CFS and the common financial statement, which is currently used. The spending guidelines are broadly similar. There's actually one less expenditure category that's covered by a spending guideline. So I don't think there'll be any increase on that front. To add to what we provide for kind of the system stuff, there is an Excel tool. We also produced a developer toolkit, which is something you can drop in to systems, which does a lot of the work, which reduces the burden slightly. And, and quite a lot of training will be available that we've produced and we free of charge to advice agencies. John Mason. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. I mean, I wonder, Mr. Simmons, if you could just explain about the money advice service mm -hmm. and I believe you're a UK government agency, is that the correct term, or can you just tell us? That's right, we're, we're an independent body settled by government, it's a technical way of putting it, uh, I think a quango would be the phrase that's, that's used, um, <coughs> but our statutory objective is to improve the quality, consistency and availability of debt advice in the UK, and the reason why I think we're 
the right people to be developing a tool like this. We have none of the access to grind around the, the, the contribution made. We want to deliver a sector that works well for both creditors and debt advice agencies. We've got no other motivator. Okay, and, and how did this come about? Why did, who decided that there was going to be this standard financial statement? It was, we, we were established in 2012. Um, and we did a consultation about what would be the right things for us to look at in the debt advice sector, it's kind of sector-wide initiatives that will help uh, do those things, improve the quality, consistency and availability of debt advice in the UK. And one of the strongest things that came back, amongst other things, was to have a standard approach to financial statements across the country, because, as I mentioned at the top, there's a lot of disadvantages to having various different approaches to that. So that was a drive, it was what the sector told us was needed. Now, you're saying you're independent from government, mm -hmm. I, I suppose, because one of our concerns might be that going forward, while we might be comfortable with the, where we are at the moment, and it seems to be the two models are not that different, mm -hmm. um, you know, could there be political pressure put on your agency in the future, either to, say, squeeze down um, what debtors are allowed to keep or inflate what mm -hmm. debtors are allowed to keep, that kind of area? Is, it, are there clear rules around this? Um, well, the methodology itself that's used to find the, the guidelines that is, is set, it is written and it is in stone. It's a process that's, that's run every year by our statistician uh, and we produce all the calculations. So it's not, it wouldn't be easy to go and change the methodology you know, secretly. Um, we have a governance committee which has got people like Sittens Advice, Sittens Advice Scotland, Money Advice Scotland, uh, most advice providers in the UK, number of creditors and the AIB who would have a say in what that methodology is. Um, so we would like to say, and, and our position is, this is a collaborative project, the Standard Financial Statement. It's really the sector's tool, not ours. And those decisions are done in consultation with uh, practitioners, really, rather than we come up with them and, and roll them out. It is done very collaboratively. And I must just put on record um, how grateful we are to AIB, who have been very collaborative in this process and shared a lot of learnings with us about the common financial tool that's been here for since 2015. Okay, thank you. So could I turn to the other three uh, on the panel and ask, are you comf also comfortable that it is Money Advice Service that is doing this and, and the process and the protections and safeguards and all that kind of stuff? Yes. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I think any, any change to that uh, methodology, as, as Craig said, is, is low risk. There's a, there's a governance group uh, set up there that covers a, a range of bodies across the, the sector. If you look at it on the other hand, and you quite like the notion of reviewing other ways that we might do this, then there's a low probability of that. So that, that would be another side of your, your question. Okay. I think generally in terms of how the, the tool is put together and working, absolutely I've got no, no concerns uh, around that. I think, I think the concerns that, that we would have uh, in relation to the regulations is really the, it's more a principle-based type thing. Um, really where the, the control of that is not within the control of uh, legislators or within Scottish Parliament. So really around the, the system of insolvency practitioner regulation, authorisation, monitoring, some of those aspects are not sufficiently well protected, I would suggest, within, within the regulations. So it moves some of that responsibility into the Money Advice Service hands uh, rather than with it, within the, 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 the legislative uh, provisions around that. And what's the concern there, sorry? I think really just that you know, we already have a, a really well-defined system of, of, of regulation. What's the code of conduct that's, that's available for the SFS, for instance, dictates or, or, or allows um, the governance group to decide who can and cannot use the SFS. But then we have, within legislation, a requirement saying, well, you have to use this. So you could potentially have the, the, the possibility, I guess, where the governance group is saying, this firm is not applying the, 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 the procedures uh, correct, therefore we want to withdraw their licence, which then impacts on uh, the ability of that debt provider uh, or insolvency practitioner to, to be able to provide their services in the regulated sector. 
so you're saying it's a bit confused the yes. picture, right? Yep. And I think so you know it could it could easily have been resolved. I think essentially by uh, the licensing being done direct to the to the AIB or the Scottish government, uh, and th and then just being brought in that way. But it's a it's a confused bit of bit of legislation in that way. Yep. Could I ask Mr. Simmons to comment on that point? Yeah, very happy to, of course. I, I think what David is saying is technically accurate. I think in practice, the likelihood of that is very slim because we've designed the SFS in collaboration with the AIB, actually, and I believe the principles that we set out in how you use the standard financial statement are the same as the AIBs. So the chances of there being a disagreement are very slim. Um, and that governance group that David has touched on has got AIB on it, actually. I would never foresee a day of us withdrawing a licence without consultation with the AIB just to give some additional comfort. SFS has been live since the 1st of April 2017 and as yet we've had no reason to remove anyone's licence so I think the likelihood of that is very small. Ms McLean? Just to add that that uh, provision exists already with CFT where you have to be licensed by the Money Advice Trust to use it and when we're talking about licence we really just mean registration so they know who's using it um, and, and whatever and we've had no instances of any, any certainly any insolvency practitioner having their licence to use uh, CFT withdrawn in that time. Right. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, um, very much convener. Um, David, I think you made some comments earlier about um, the fact that the standard financial statement um, uh, and trigger figures are calculated using average spending by the low, the bottom quintile of, of income, uh, household income comes. Um, is that a concern, therefore, that the um, standard financial statement is not taking account of what some critics would regard as a reasonable standard of living as opposed to the standard of living um, of the lowest income households who by definition are probably spending less than they should be in certain areas. Um, shall I take that one? First, um, the point around the spending guide, and this has been a, a topic of debate um, amongst the sector around this, um, we did an, uh, an exercise with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, I think it was just over a year ago, now, to compare the spending guidelines with the minimum income standard that they set, and they found that broadly the two are aligned, uh, and most interestingly, of all to me, it was a surprise that actually the ONS figures look at the lowest quintile of income, um, but actually it doesn't look at the lowest quintile of expenditure. I don't want to get into jargon here, but actually the expenditure levels at that lowest quintile <coughs> use is actually the second would be the second quintile of expenditure. So that gave us some real reassurance that it, it is broadly aligned with the minimum income standard that the Joseph Roundtree Foundation do, and we've committed to running that exercise regularly to see if they broadly stay aligned or if they're diverging. And if they start to diverge, you know, we'll look into that. So the question is not so much whether they're aligned with the minimum income standards, but whether they should be aligned with reasonable income standards. This is something the governance group of advice providers, AIB and creditors considered, and it was deemed that the current methodology is the most appropriate. Okay, any other comments? I'll come in that. And again, the, I want to give credit to, to Craig again here. I'm going to make you blush, sorry. Uh, but we, we long called for that comparison work to be done between where the trigger figures sit and what is understood as a socially acceptable living standard. Uh, so we're really pleased to see that work undertaken. The only household type within that research, and, and the committee might be interested in that research incidentally, the only household type that had a, a better deal under minimum income standard, if you like, than under the trigger figures, was for a single person. Now, every other household time, type fell slightly below the minimum income standard within that analysis. We also found that lone parent Households were disproportionately impacted. Now, I, I know that we can talk about uh, guidelines being broadly aligned. On paper, that might look the case. If, if you've got £15 a week less than, say, uh, a minimum income standard, it looks broadly aligned on paper. But in practice, when you think of what that household's forsaking week to week through a payment agreement that might last five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Now, I think it's easy to view a financial statement as something of a sort of abstract concept. 
It's an income and expenditure form essentially with certain guidelines when spending. Of course it is that, but it does so much more than that. It effectively sets out a standard of living for a household, for a client, over the period of them repaying their debts. Uh, we've been consistent that it's a drawback of CFS and SFS that we don't have a way of checking whether or not that payment agreement uh, leaves somebody with a socially acceptable living standard. That's something that we've advocated, that there's not a lot of support for, uh, I'll rephrase that, that there's no support for uh, from the SFS governance group. Uh, but again, it's an example of something that if we had control of this ourselves, that's something that we could aspire to. I don't know why you wouldn't want to know that the payment agreement that you've set up, where that leaves somebody in terms of a socially acceptable standard of living. OK. Um, this, these, these are regulations which Parliament will decide whether to approve or not. Uh, we, we can't amend them. Of course. Um, it's a take it or leave it. I was intrigued at the uh, ICAS... Um, say in your evidence, we would strongly encourage the AIB and Scottish Government to defer any decision on the use of CFS or SFS and instead urgently carry out an assessment of the policy effectiveness behind the CFT. Is it your view, therefore, that we should not pass these regulations? I think that's clearly for, for Parliament to decide, but I think there is a... Uh, yes, I'm asking whether what's your view as to what <laughs> Parliament should do. There, there is an, a, a need, certainly, to review the common financial tool and the methodology in behind that. You know, as I say, whether it is the SFS or the CFS, I think broadly the contribution levels are going to come out uh, about the same. Um, you know, whether we want to change to SFS, then carry out a review and implement a further change further down the line if, if, if that's necessary. Um, I don't think that's, that's necessarily desirable. I would much rather probably that we carry out that review now and make one change at the, at the right time. Is the implication of what you're saying is that there has been no review at all? There must be, have been some that, review. That's I, I'm not aware of a review of the effect, effectiveness of the CFT being introduced through uh, the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Act having been carried out as yet. So in a sense this um, legislative change is being proposed in the absence of any assessment of the policy effectiveness of the existing tool, I, I would suggest that the the under the the underlying uh, rationale behind these regulations is simply because, on a UK wide basis, there is now the standard financial statement. There is the um, the withdrawal of the, the the CFS being maintained, and those two items there are are, are, are driving the change in, in in regulations, not actually whether there's a, a policy need to change the regulations. Yeah. Okay. Could I just add? I think there is perhaps a a tendency for the the, the Parliament for the government to to look at this just in well, what can we fix? We can fix a bit of bankruptcy law. We, we can bring in SFS for CFS. There are whole other policy issues that sit behind this about minimum uh, wage, about living wage, about um, what is a socially accepted minimal level of income. And these regulations are not going to fix that. And it, it, it's arguably, um, there, there's all sorts of other things. You know, we, we've long called in the insolvency profession in Scotland for a root and branch review of uh, whether the family home, for example, should be included in a bankruptcy or a protected trust deed. Now, that, we can have that debate, but that has to be set against a whole discussion, a wider discussion about housing policy in the country, for example. And therefore, I think there's a tendency to think that, oh, well, we'll bring in SFS, and that's going to fix all of these other issues. It won't. SFS is a tool and a mechanism and a measure. There are other wider issues that probably have to be addressed, and, and I would respectfully suggest are out with the scope of these regulations. D David, do you have any comment on whether, in fact, we should be deferring any decision or not? Yeah, I, th I think that, as I've said already, the drawbacks within CFS you'll also see in SFS. Uh, in, in that case, uh, th there's not much difference there. I, th I think what we'd echo David's 
call for a review of the effectiveness of the policy. Uh, we'd also welcome a review of uh, potential alternatives. But I think one thing that, that we need to do as a sector a whole lot better, I mean, been, that this process is engaged with a range of IPs, a range of money advisors, a range of creditors, but we haven't really heard from people and uh, people who, who are in these plans. And one of the most encouraging things I've seen from Scottish Government in recent years was the establishment of experience panels uh, with the, the view that who better to help shape a new system than people with experience and often quite unpleasant experience of the previous system. And I, I think that's what we need to do in a debt advice context as well uh, in the decision of whether to go ahead with this current process or review what other options might be available to us. And do we have any sense of what those other options might be? I mean, what, what are the alternatives? Have they been explored or I mean p perhaps I could uh, just reflect I guess on some other uh, countries experience where they they, they don't uh, use this particular method so if you look particularly at uh, Canada or Australia uh, for instance the way they assess debtor contributions or surplus income into that is that they will take the income level they've got a number of bands which take into account how many people are in the household dependencies etc and they set an element of income which is you know, out with the scope of debtor contributions, and then they set a percentage above that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very straightforward uh, system, it's really easy to understand. It doesn't have cost to maintain. Um, it, you know, it doesn't have a large administrative burden. Um, and, you know, that could be used as a model, I would suggest, within, within Scotland. Um, I wouldn't suggest exactly the same because, again, I think that there are um, some disadvantages that it doesn't particularly take account of, uh, you know, people with additional support needs or, or that sort of thing where there might be levels of expenditure required there. But I think that sort of system with a, an adapted percentage for Scotland, perhaps with an additional per, uh, lower percentage uh, for those additional needs people, uh, could, could work effectively within Scotland. So, so you, you, you hinted that in your in your evidence and in paragraph nine you say the end result of such a system would be to increase the returns to creditors. How what what what's the basis for that? By simply claim? reducing the cost of administering the, okay. the calculation. Right, that's helpful. Yeah. So it's not sorry, yes, so so just to clarify, it wouldn't result necessarily in increased debtor contributions yep. resulting in uh, increased to creditors, but it would uh, lower the cost of administration. Okay, that's helpful. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. There's any number of alternatives. As, as David's outlined, you could have a, a set percentage contribution. If, if, if consistency is the objective of this policy, then that seems a really consistent approach. Uh, you could draw on the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's minimum income standard. Uh, if you wanted to sort of enshrine the living standards debate at the, the heart of this process, you could apply the SFS without spending guidelines. As a format itself, it's absolutely fine. It, it, it looks good. It works well. Uh, the concern, as we've all heard, comes from the spending guidelines. So, and I, I don't say that to to sound facetious, but we saw in the AIB's consultation that spending guidelines shouldn't influence contributions. Well, if they shouldn't influence uh, what somebody's paying towards their debt, then why have them at all? Uh, so there's, there's, there's no limit to the alternatives uh, I feel that we, we could be examining. Someone's wanted to say something on this. Th thank you. Um, I just want to give some extra reassurance to the committee that the standard financial statement has been, you know, some years in the making actually, and it's looked to build on the good practice, it's already out there, so it's it's taken what's worked in the common financial statement, it's also taken what's worked in the step change approach which they use, and various others that are used in, in public approaches to affordability assessments, and it has been tested with the money advice community at quite good length. So I'm confident this is the current best practice available. Um, just to touch on the point around spending guidelines, I just think it's worth touching on what's in our guidance uh, for using the standard financial statement, which is, they are exactly that, guidelines. They are not allowances to be capping people's expenditure at. To pick up on David's point, you know, it allows that degree of discretion and flexibility for money advisors to look at a person's individual circumstances and say, actually, the expenditure does need to be above that, and I'll put a note on the format to, to record why. Um, finally, and I, I won't take up too much of the committee's time on this, 
the ONS uh, survey, which is the basis of the methodology, our assessment is that is the most robust set of data out there at the moment for building a set of guidelines like this. We, we looked at the Joseph Roundtree uh, approach, and we worked very well with the Joseph Roundtree uh, Foundation, actually. Uh, but their sample size is quite small, and the, the way they update it annually is not across every household type. They only update bits of it annually, so we'd run the risk of it not being up to date. You say you've tested it um, across the sector, but have you tested it with debtors themselves? So it's being used in England with a number of large providers who are reporting it's working well. That, that's with advisors, but what about the debtors themselves? So it's being used with debtors at the minute in England, hundreds of thousands of debtors in England. You know, no, my point is, is the experience of the debtors and their views of the system being taken into account? Um, not as yet, because we are... I've rolled it out only a year and a half ago, but we have a plan to evaluate both the impact on the client, the impact on the debt advisor, and the impact on the creditor. And that's when we reach a certain scale. We're hoping that Scotland will be on board when we do that, so we can test the, the impact of it. It's a new policy, so we, we will evaluate it. We always do. OK, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. If there are no further questions from committee members, thank you for coming in. And um, I'll suspend the session. We'll move into private session. Thank you. Thank you.